So if the total energy of the chain is delta F for the rest of the chain plus delta Eps. And if I ask myself, what is the likelihood that this forms a protein? For that to happen, their sum must be smaller than zero. Otherwise, the free energy would be positive. Or alternatively, what I'm saying is that what is the probability that the rest of the chain has a free energy that is smaller than minus delta epsilon, just moving over that on the right side. We can calculate that by looking at all the possible values delta F might have, because again, there are going to be tons of different ways we can fold this sequence, right? And then just seeing how likely is it for this to happen. In principle, I don't know that probability distribution, but the second you hear many and probabilities, the way we're going to solve that is the central limit theorem, which says that if you're just adding up enough random samples, the probability distribution function is going to turn into Gaussian if they're independent. I also know that the average here is going to be very positive. Most proteins will not just fold. So I'll draw the y-axis there and the x-axis there. So the y-axis is just probability density. And here on the x-axis, I have what is the energy of the rest of the chain. Again, I'm not really defining anything here. Well, I'm defining, but I'm not drawing the conclusion that any Gaussian will have an average. And let's use those angle brackets for that average. And I also have some sort of width sigma. The only reason for introducing those is that we typically specify Gaussians with them. And if I specify those two, I can say that the probability distribution of delta F equals, leave some space, E raised to minus delta F minus delta F in square brackets, the average, square that term, divided by 2 sigma squared. But if it's a probability distribution here, I also need the integral here to be 1. And I get the integral 1 by putting a factor in front of it. If you're nasty, you can actually just put a C there because it's not going to matter what it is. But it's going to be 2 pi sigma square if you want it to be fully correct. We're almost done, um, but not quite. In general, if I want to start calculating the integral here, it's going to help me to have a simpler expression for this. I will simplify this in a second. So uh, leave me a little space there um, so that I can have one more term in that equation. And then I'm going to continue up here. So what I really wanted to ask myself, right, is what, what was the probability of this happening? Meaning that delta F falls below minus delta epsilon. Well, somewhere here I'm going to have a value minus delta epsilon. I don't know where it's positive or negative right now, but in general it's going to be much smaller than large delta F, right? Because this is just one residue, that is the rest of the chain. The probability of this happening is just the integral from minus infinity up to that value, right? So the probability of delta upper scale F being smaller than minus delta epsilon equals the integral from minus infinity to minus delta epsilon of P as a function of delta F, D delta F. Maybe it's not such a good idea to use delta F here everywhere, but this is not going to be as complicated as you think. I bet that you're tearing your hair uh, at uh, integrating that function, right? Actually, you can't even integrate it. The integral of e to the minus x squared is the error function. Don't worry, we're not going to go deep into math here. If I'm looking at the entire integral here, in general, for most of this, delta f is going to be a large value. And in particular, it's going to be, sorry, delta f in brackets is going to be a large value. The average here is typically going to be much smaller than the values I'm looking here at delta f. So if I assume that delta f within brackets is much larger than delta f, that term is going to result in three parts. I'm going to have, if I were to expand this term, I would get first with de delta f squared. That can be either a small or a large number, but in general, pretty small. 
at least close to zero, I will have average delta f squared that will always be a large number. And then when I have a component that's minus 2 delta f multiplied by delta f within brackets, that's going to be an intermediate size number. Since delta f within bracket squared is always large, larger than average than the other terms, I could simplify this. That means, and this is where you need the extra space, first I'm going to get one expression and now I'm going to write this out, but you can start calling this c prime and c bis, the constants won't matter. 1 over 2 pi sigma squared. Let's use the first expression in that part. That would be e raised to minus delta f in brackets squared divided by 2 sigma 2 multiplied by the next term. So that's minus minus. That's going to be plus 2 and that 2 cancels the 2 in the denominator here. That's going to be e raised to now delta f, not square brackets. And then I'm going to write this in a slightly different way. I'm going to divide it by sigma square divided by delta f in brackets. This is not as complicated as it looks, because this is where the radical me enters. I don't really care about the proportionality constants here. So that's just some arbitrary constant, so this is some arbitrary constant. Note how delta f itself doesn't enter here, just the average and the spread. So forget about this part for now. We're going to need to keep it just a little while. Uh, this is the only function I'm interested in, and this is a beautiful function. This is an exponential. It's a plain, simple exponential. It's just a function e raised to delta f. Yeah, yeah, there's some constants. I don't care about constants. This, my friends, you know how to integrate. It's an exponential with a constant. That constant is going to, well, you're going to get something in front of it. What do we do with constants? I don't care about constants. So this proportionality corresponds to, well, first I need to take this value when this expression delta f is minus epsilon. So there's going to be some sort of constant, so now I group everything there into a constant. And then I'm going to erase e raised to minus delta epsilon divided by that entire expression, sigma squared divided by delta f, the average squared minus the corresponding expression minus infinity, but e raised to the minus infinity is going to be zero, so I don't care about that. Do you see how I approach this? I radically simplify and I throw away the constants. Uh, generations of my math teachers would cry at what I do here, but this is why physics and biophysics is different from math. Do you see this expression? The probability of this being stable, of this being a neat small protein, is something that looks like a Boltzmann distribution. But it's not the Boltzmann distribution. We don't have temperature here. So this is proportional to the proportionality of that small factor, delta epsilon, which has units of energy. So the, the entire thing here, oh, sorry, there shouldn't, be a, there shouldn't be a two there. This entire thing must also have units of energy. We're not quite sure why that is yet, but let's look at that in a second. What this means is that if delta epsilon is a very, if this defect is pretty much zero, uh, well, what's that going to mean? Then I put a small defect here, then this term is not going to be too bad. On the other hand, if the defect is a very large number here, then I'm going to end up in exactly the same problem I had with uh, the Boltzmann distribution, right? If I introduce a very large energy, it's going to be very costly for me to introduce this defect in the sense that it's going to be a very low probability that I can introduce it there. So this works. This works remarkably well. What is the denominator here? It's not kT. Well, in a way, you have something that has units of energy and you could almost derive a temperature because if we divide this by Boltzmann's constant, we would get something that had units of temperature. Sigma here, that was related to how broad the distribution is. And the average here, delta F, this is really just the average energy of, chain of amino acids in the chain. 
So this whole part has some sort of characteristic energy for this particular sequence. Um, if you convert that to a temperature, it would be maybe 350 Kelvin or something. Don't worry too much about it. This is a constant whose properties are determined by the amino acid compositions. But the point here is that there's nothing here that depends on the chains, the total chain energy. Because sigma square is proportional to the size of the protein. The average energy is also proportional to the size of the protein, so they cancel out. The only part remaining then is delta epsilon, so that the probability of a particular chain being stable, or the, the probability of this defect not being too bad, is only determined by the small defect, not the rest of the chain. And that's why we get these properties that breaking one or two hydrogen bonds can be so disastrous that this makes an entire protein not fold. It walks like a Boltzmann distribution, it quacks like a Boltzmann distribution, but it's in fact not a Boltzmann distribution.